quest is your only guide, you won't discover anything new. So, we challenge you to open your mind, to start your expedition into the unknown. Liftoff! We have a liftoff! You may be scared and feel insecure. You will experience setbacks and make mistakes. If you're not prepared to be wrong, you will never come up with anything original. So find out. Dare to fail. Explore. And discover. The future starts with not knowing. Embrace it. Some of you I met last year, some of you I have, will not meet this year, only digitally. Uh, but the future starts with not knowing, and that's a given fact. Uh, but we are never uh, prepared for it. We are not prepared for the chaos theory. You've got this chaos theory mm -hmm. that on the butterfly e effect, that one small butterfly somewhere in Brazil can make a big tornado happening in the Midwest of the US or in Canada or whatever. Uh, but we are never plan for plan B. Uh, we always plan for plan A and want to uh, make sure that plan A works and is being improved every day. But what we, uh, what we discovered last year that not this butterfly, but this small virus somewhere in China in Wuhan, well, uh, disrupted the whole world. And that's a given fact. So the future starts with not knowing. We don't know where we will be next year, but we have to t cope with it. And my, my small talk is about uh, cities, uh, smart cities. I dislike this term, I'll come back to that later, but uh, how, how can we plan for things we cannot plan? And uh, there's only one continent in this whole world who, has not, uh, uh, who, who didn't have any effect of COVID, that's in Antarctica, but the rest of the world needs to cope and find ways to uh, <laughs> uh, cope with this virus. But is it the virus or is it that we as a human species are not prepared for plan B? We <laughs> don't plan chaos because we hate chaos, we like structure, we like planning, we like all this kind of stuff. We do it in our daily jobs, we do it in the, the way we plan cities, but maybe that's something we need to challenge. And you've got three generations of smart cities. The first generation of a smart city was a lot of stuff happening within a city, but we didn't plan it, it just happened, we didn't know how to take care of it. or there was no uh, alliance between the city planners and people within the city. The second generation, uh, that's when the term smart cities came alive. It's, it, in fact, it's a sales term invented by IBM, and it's about making technology do everything within that city. But the fact is, well, from my point of view, technology normally makes life more efficient, makes, technology makes everything in life more efficient, and I don't hope that if I become 70 or 80, I look back on my life of, as, as having led the most efficient life uh, you could have expected. I think life is not about efficiency, life is about inefficiency, and life is about meeting people you didn't expect to meet. It's not about planning. And the third generation of smart city is the, the cities who really work together with people within that city to make a city more inclusive. And the only thing to do, the only way to do that is not plan everything, but by co-creation. And so we need to think when we plan cities and think about uh, making uh, sure that people can live in a city, that the inst the, 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 uh, it shouldn't be about uh, tech and tech and tech. It should be about people, people, people and quality of life. And one thing to make a point, it's quality of life doesn't mean for that I can, the quality, I can have the quality of life as uh, needed, but because a lot of being is it's being published about human-centered design, we should design everything about humans. I think that's wrong. 
Uh, I dislike also the idea of human-centered design. I think it should be humanity-centered design about what does this world need in the, in the long term, uh, what does that mean for cities and how can we make quality of life as, uh, as, as huge as possible for people, but given this fact that we need to take care of our planet too. So, me and my colleague Boyd Cohen, we did a lot of research, I won't go into, into deep depth, but uh, there are a lot of parameters that are involved when planning cities and making life more worthwhile within a city and also taking into account the planet and uh, the we need to take care of the future generations. And we were busy with this, we were doing a lot of projects uh, with this, and then COVID happened. And we decided, what, what are we going to do now? What is the embassy of mobility from the, the, from the Dutch Design Week? What do we do now? Do we uh, yeah, keep doing what we did? Or are we going to ask questions? Because I think the basic thing, uh, the future manifests itself not in, uh, not in answers, but in questions. I think there are a lot of answers in this world about wh where the world is going to and what we need, but that's something for politicians who shout to each other, no, I'm right, I'm right, no, that, that's a, by like a big fight. But it's about to keep asking questions, questions all the time. And that's what we did when COVID broke out, because we didn't know how this was going to affect life from a mobility point of view within cities. And we found, based on the research, we did a lot of research all over the world, what happened within cities and how did cities cope with this COVID virus from a mobility point of view. We found three parameters. Those three parameters I wanna, uh, I wanna uh, go deep into and I wanna share them with you. The first parameter is what we have been seeing is that cities adapt. Thus, how can cities adapt to this COVID virus? Uh, one example is the city of Boston, for instance. They uh, are being to uh, the, the city is instructing or, or thinking about healthy lanes. How can we make sure that people go from A to B in the most healthiest way? And healthy doesn't not not, not, not only mean by walking or whatever, but uh, making sure that social distance is important. And how can we? plan this city that you've got health streets, streets in which if you take that, stre that street, it might take you a bit longer, but you get there in the most safest way. Uh, this is uh, uh, something that's happening within city planning too. I really like this example of Vienna. They are planning a big park in the center of Vienna and you can walk through the woods, there are big trees. Uh, they will be bigger and bigger. Uh, they are around two, two, two meters, uh, sorry if I'm forgetting about the inches, but two or <laughs> two and a half meters. <laughs> so it feels like walking in the woods, but you can go into one path and it's, you walk through this park and you get out 20 minutes later on some, but you won't meet anyone. It's like walking in the center of a city, going, uh, having some nature involved, but uh, it's a safe lane too, because you won't meet any people, but you get in at one point and you get in at the other point and you are not allowed to walk in from the wrong way. But I like this aspect too, how can we make sure that safe lanes start happening within city parks too. Then you've got the city of Paris, that's an important uh, one and that's being adapted in more and more cities all over the world that they think about we people need to be able to uh, enjoy Paris within a 50 minute distance walking. Everything you need will be within that 50 minutes. Uh, and of course, in the set city of the center, there is a supermarket, there is some nature, there is something for young people to play a playground or whatever, some sporting grounds. But they are th taking this more into account now also for the banlieues, the, the banlieues, the, the, the outside of Paris. How can we make sure that everybody what everybody needs within is within 50 minute walking distance and cities all around the world are trying to adapt to this. How can we make sure that the supermarket is there, some sporting ground and everything within 50 minutes. So the city adapts, that means that people don't need to travel that much. So there will be less uh, mobility uh, events happening and that will make life maybe more, uh, 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 will give it a better quality of life. The second factor we uh, saw is that adaptive, that mobility services adapt. 
That means this is in the underground in, uh, in London. Well, you can travel. Thank you, essential workers and everybody else. Go home, don't travel, <laughs> save lives. So make sure that only people who need to go there can travel there safely and the rest of us, well, follow another route. What we see is a lot of cycling is happening more and more. So uh, a lot of cities thought about it for a long time, make sure that uh, less cars in the city centers and more people being able to cycle. It was very, very difficult to make progress in it. Then COVID happened and then we could do it instantly. Within six months, everything was being taken care of. This is one of the most famous ro roads in Paris, the Rue de Rivoli. And now you're not allowed to drive there anymore. It's for, and there's a lot of experiments now within cities with this cycling uh, experiments. And if this works for people, people will have a better quality of life. Well, it will be, uh, scars will be uh, stopped in these city centers for good. So it's now still an experiment, but they are driving this experiment. Well, they are learning a lot from it. This is in Bogota, in Colombia. They build, uh, they make sure that around 80 kilometers of roads in Bogota, uh, you're not to allowed to drive cars there anymore, only buses or cycling, and a lot of people cycle. Uh, so we see a lot of things happening over there that uh, uh, cities, not city is adapted, but the way of the way people move is uh, being adapted. This is in San Francisco, a study. Uh, more and more people are taking their uh, bikes up there. Uh, this is uh, data by streetlight data. And more and more people are cycling up there too. And we could do it at first, but then there were a lot of cars. Now, not, not so many cars anymore. So cycling has become more easier. This is a project in the Netherlands with e-bikes in, uh, in the surrounding of 45 minutes of Schiphol, the most important uh, uh, air, uh, airports in the Netherlands. A lot of people take uh, flights from out of Schiphol. Uh, they are uh, doing experiments over there with electric bikes and you can, for 45 minutes outside of the Schiphol, you start, uh, you, you have this app and uh, the traffic lights uh, adapt themselves to these bikes. If a lot of bikes are progressing to these traffic lights, they will have a green light and cars need to, uh, uh, need to wait. Uh, this bike is, of oh, this app is uh, that smart that it adapts itself. It will say, well, instead of 25 kilometers an hour, now go to 22 because then you will have a green light. And a lot of people are really happy with this uh, experiment because now they know for sure they will get there on time. They don't care about weather or whatever, but this is a big experiment in the Netherlands. So the last factor is that humans adapt, that we as a sp we humans, we have other kind of questions. We see this with mass solutions, mobility as a service solutions. Normally last year, we not, not one of us would have thought about this factor, or this uh, parameter. You've got faster, cheaper, eco-friendly, and now you've got the social distance choice too. By which uh, way of transport is my social distance uh, taking granted in the, in the best way? So we, we would never have thought about this one. This has become a factor based on chaos, but this is what's happening also, that we take other parameters now into, into account when traveling from A to B. So we as a human species, also think differently about uh, mobility and uh, quality of life now. So these three parameters have a big impact. Uh, what we are going to do in the Netherlands, we are now going to do uh, uh, experiments with this embassy of mobility. What if we take these three factors into account and plot them on uh, brain pot over here in the region of Eindhoven? But what if you would plot these parameters on, for instance, the city of Vancouver? What would happen then? What if we would, how can this city of Vancouver adapt? Is it possible to have a 50 minute society? What if we think about the way people move? How can we make sure that uh, different ways, more eco-friendly ways, more uh, quality of life ways are being experimented with from a mobility point of view? And how can we cope with the, the, the ways people make decisions when traveling. So social distancing, I think uh, I know in these mass things that it's even uh, being programmed now that you know which carriage of the metro was cleaned uh, uh, two hours before 
and maybe some other two days before. So then I'm willing to wait for the one that has been cleaned uh, uh, two hours before. So I'll be willing to wait. So take into account these three parameters. So how can Vancouver adapt or Toronto adapt? How can the ways people use their mobility, uh, mobility ways adapt to, uh, this, uh, uh, to the city? And how can we take care of the wishes people have when moving from A to B to make sure that we progress, have a better quality of life, and uh, that we uh, design from a humanity-centered approach instead of from a human-centered approach?